Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. And happy Monday to all of you. Hope that your weekend went well. Turkey season's in full swing here in Pennsylvania. And I know across the U.S. and a lot of places. I hope that you got some val- valuable information out of the, the recent turkey hunting podcast. So that'll be, that'll be it for the turkey hunting content here this spring. But I did want to share with you. So Pennsylvania opened up last Saturday and talked a little bit about, you know, the opener on last week's episode. But the week was full of action for me. I would go out every morning before work. I only had really about 45 minutes to hunt before I'd have to hike back to the truck, change, go to work. And so I I was getting into birds, it seemed like, almost every day and either ran out of time and had to back out or uh, private property kind of limited my boundaries there. And then so this hunt on Wednesday, it was Wednesday, May 1st, I believe, I was hunting um, the spot where I was at the day before and ended up calling seven gobblers in off the roost. It was a little bit off the roost. They, uh, I think they'd hit the ground by the time I heard them. And the day before, they were with hens. This day, for some reason, there was no hens. And five jakes and two longbeards came running in. Had the jakes at about five, ten yards all around me. I'm waiting for these long beards to come. Uh, finally had, uh, had a shot at 43 yards at one of the big toms and put them, put it on him, squeezed the trigger and boom, three of the other birds shot gobbled, but they all flew away. And I was like, it didn't even move. It didn't do no feathers, nothing. I just completely missed. And I was kind of you know, besides myself, couldn't figure out what I did wrong. Everything felt good. I mean, I was shaking like a little kid, but I I held it on there. And I'm, you know, I'm using 12 gauge three and a half inch uh, shotgun and, you know, had never really had problems with, with missing with that gun particularly. And so anyways, I was just really bummed, left, you know, how to go to work. And I went to... Then after work, I went and started shooting my gun and bought another box of shells. And it was patterning like eight to 10 inches to the right. Could not figure out what happened. Like, why is it shooting like that? You can't move shotgun sights, you know, left and right. Uh, you know, up and down's one thing, but left and right, what am I doing? You know, I'm repositioning my head, trying everything. Nothing seems right. Look at the back sight, nothing. I didn't really look at the front sight. I, I'm running like those uh, Dead Ringer, can't remember what they're exactly called, but they have like a fiber optic front pin and then like almost like a peep sight on the back and you line the two up. Well, got home that night and I was just still, I went through almost a whole box of shells and couldn't get it figured out and ended up realizing that my front pin, looked at it, it was just a tiny bit crooked and... I touched it and it spun all the way around. <laughs> so that's uh, that was obviously the problem, but it uh, so I had to add a little bit of like blue Loctite to it, just one little drop on it so I can get it out if I need it. Screwed it back in, made sure everything was good, and now we're good to go. But it's still um, a problem that I should have pre- been able to prevent if I would have shot my gun a couple days leading up to the season. You know, it's, it could have happened after that. And again, I take complete responsibility on not shooting my gun right beforehand. Like I normally do. I was really busy and just thought, you know, basically took the lazy route and being like, my gun's on every year. What it's a shotgun. What do you need to, to practice with it? And that was again, completely my fault for assuming that and taking the shortcut. Cause it cost me a big bird. So Learn that lesson the hard way, but uh, gonna keep after it here this week and just continue to 
wake up early, hunt before work, and then, you know, get a chance on Saturday to hunt for a while. But that's kind of how that's been going. Um, in other news, it's been one year since we came into business, or when I say we, I mean me, and East meets West. So I filed for it. Um, business license in the state of Pennsylvania, the end of last April. And now here we are in May, one year in, and super excited about that. So I just wanted to give her an offer up to all the East Meets West listeners and, and anyone else that supported us. So if you go over to the website and enter in your email when it pops up and says, you know, subscribe for updates, Put in your email there. You'll get an exclusive code sent over to you immediately. If you don't, please let me know. And you'll get uh, a little discount on apparel. But this sale is only running through this Tuesday, May 7th. So just understand if you're listening to this at a later date, this only runs till May 7th, 2019. Check that out and you know pick up some some East meets West swag there at a little bit of a discount with, if you're relatively new to listening, that apparel, I donate 3% of them to backcountry hunters and anglers and the QDMA right now, depending on which apparel item it is. And that's itemized under each of the, the items pages on the website. You can see where the money's going and uh, hopefully you got some ideas coming for some shirts this fall and we'll be adding some different organizations in there that I believe in and want to support. So check that out at eastmeetswesthunt.com backslash shop. And I'm also getting ready for the Total Archery Challenge coming up here in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania. If you're somewhat local, you should definitely check out this event. It's a four-day event this year. I believe it's sold out already. And... I have a booth there again, so I, I basically launched the company there last year, and so I'll be there recording some podcasts, selling apparel, hopefully get some shooting in if I get someone to watch the booth for a little bit so I can get a chance to shoot, and awesome event, really love Total Archery Challenge, been, been going since the beginning as just a shooter, and then started going, working the event. And now have my own company there. So it's a, it's a really good time. That's going to be May 30th or June 2nd. So uh, check that out. All right. I want to get into the sponsors here before we get into the podcast with Brad Luttrell of Go Wild. So first and foremost, University of Elk Hunting. Corey Jacobson, Elk 101, have put together a comprehensive course. It's an annual course that you go through to plan your own do-it-yourself elk hunt from the beginning stages to the end. And I wanted to share a little quick tip of something that I learned this this past week um, of using it. So I've learned this in the past from the course, but it's something you don't use all the time, so you forget. And when I'm scouting on Google Earth, I'm scouting some of the units I'm looking to hunt in Idaho, and you drop a pin on Google Earth, and there's a way of being able to transfer that right to your Onyx app or your Onyx chip. So that's really helpful. Instead of having to bounce back and forth between the two on there, you can find it on Google Earth, mark these areas, mark elk hotspot number one, and transfer it over. So all the details on how to do that is in Corey's course. Very helpful. And that's my kind of tip of the week from the University of Elk Hunting. He's offering up 20% off this course by entering code East Meets West at checkout. So check that out. And to keep going a little further here with the partners, Maven Optics has been a big supporter of me from really from the beginning of this. And I've been purchasing their products and their optics now uh, for quite a while. And I want to talk about their B2s, their 9x45s. Those are the first pair of optics I purchased from them, uh, my elk hunting glass, and I used them for deer hunting until I picked up their their smaller B3s, but those B2s are an amazing all-around piece of glass. Low light is, is second to none with that. 
So Maven's able to come out with these high quality optics at a very low price compared to their competitors from their direct to consumer business model. So basically they are selling only online or at shows. There's uh, no middleman there and able to give you the, the best product at a lower price. Check them out at mavenbuilt.com and use the code eastmeetswest-gift to get yourself a free gift with any full price optics order. And also here, we'll get into the show in a second, but what I wanted to talk about was I've been in the market or I guess testing different trail cameras now. I really got into it last year as I've just had a variety of cameras over the years. Um, anything from your, your Bushnells, your Moultries, Brownings, uh, Coverts, whole bunch of them. And there's some of those cameras I've really liked and others that I haven't, but I never found consistency between them. And when I'd have problems, I wasn't able to, to get, you know, the customer support that I needed or that one year warranty, it'd run out in 14 months and I'd be kind of in trouble. Well, so I came across this company that I've actually been researching for about three years now is Exodus Trail Cameras or Exodus Outdoor Gear. So I purchased one of their Trek cameras here recently and have been using it. Really liked the camera. It's, it's, uh, it seems really well built. The picture quality is excellent. And that's just the, you know, their entry level camera. And I'll be trying out a bunch more this year as I'm adding a full line to, to my arsenal. But uh, I was talking to the guys over at Exodus and they're kicking off uh they're kicking off their four year anniversary sale of being in business. And so as a thank you for that, they're sharing some great savings to help everyone for this year's hashtag velvet fest and upcoming season there'll be some more uh information on what that means uh you know coming in the coming months here but from now until may 28th if you use the code year four to save 25 percent off the exodus lift 2 the exodus trek and their newly released solar panel in case you're not familiar with that product line the lift 2 provides uh, industry leading uh, full HD video and really the Trek, which is that the first model I bought, is built like a tank and will be able to gather intel for years to come. And their new 12 volt solar panel will work with any of the Exodus cameras and many other 12 volt trail cameras. So be sure to check that out as well. So over the last four years, this company has consistently shown to build quality trail cameras that just flat out work and they have the best trail camera warranty period and that's the this is the part that i really wanted to stress and cover about it and why i found interest in in purchasing one of these cameras and they're backed by a five-year warranty and that even comes with theft and damage coverage so yeah it's five years literally half a decade you'll be covered by the exodus five-year warranty but more than likely you won't need it because the cameras are built to last. I haven't used one for that long to be able to attest for that, but had some buddies that have sworn by them from the beginning and have had no issues with their cameras. That's a, again, that's a big deal for me. I don't like, you know, just checking out, you know, everyone that, that, uh, that, you know, buys these products and just trying to put it out there, you know, for social media recognition or whatever it might be. But, for me, I want to trust the people that are using it uh, consistently and my friends, I truly believe in that. And they've shown me that that these cameras are just, like I said, built like a tank. So if you want to check these out, um, they're coming out with a savings opportunity here. So as I said earlier, use the code YEAR4, and that's just spelled out Y-E-A-R, the number four. And you'll save 25% at checkout while supplies last at exodusoutdoorgear.com. So be sure to head over there and give these folks some support and save some money yourself. All right, let's get into the podcast here with Brad Luttrell from Go Wild. Thank you. All right, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. And I have on the line tonight, 
Brad Latrell coming out of Louisville, Kentucky. What's up, Brad? Hey, man, how's it going? I, I was trying to order a pizza. Are we doing a podcast? Yeah, I think you got the wrong <laughs> number, man. Oh, dude. All right. All right. I'm a little confused tonight, I guess. My calendar's all out of whack. I thought it was pizza night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had your calendar invite. I, I think you clicked on the wrong one. I don't know if you can Skype oh, for shoot. pizza, but hey, give it a shot. <laughs> all right. Well, my wife will be disappointed, but uh, yeah, let's just roll with the podcast instead. Yeah. Yeah. She'll be uh, hungry for a little bit, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, I'll let you deal with that one later and I'll, I'll yeah. you know exit the I'll call at that point. <laughs> I'll figure it out. How's it going, man? It's going well. It's going real well here. Uh, hoping spring's breaking here in Pennsylvania and and that's about it. What's going on in Brad's world? Uh, well, we're just hoping for it to dry up here in Kentucky. It's been it's been raining nonstop here all winter long. Um, a good portion of us, like me, are pissed that it's like it could be snow, uh, but it's not. So we're, we're just been dealing with that. And actually, it's snowing now. And now that it's March, it's deciding to snow. So I have a, a fear that it's going to be like last turkey season, in which case I, I went out on a Saturday. I think it opened up on Saturday. I went out. It was you know kind of 65 degrees. Next day, it's like 50 and raining. And then the next day I went out, it was snowing. And I have a picture of me with like snow piling up on my sleeve. And we're talking about Kentucky here. This is not Pennsylvania. Yeah. This is this is like, um, you know, we we are two weeks away from the Kentucky Derby where people are supposed to be wearing like flip flops and, and horse hats. You know, it's not like like the weather here typically in April is nice. Uh, you're not used to getting snowed on. So, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, man. The weather weather here is always kind of a little bizarre. We're in that weird place that has the extreme of every season and we don't have much of a spring or fall. So you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, sounds a little bit off this year. So does when does your turkey season open up uh april 15th ish don't quote me on the exact day but it's mid-april yeah it opens up that weekend and uh i've already got a couple hunts planned i'm hoping to get out i, I hunted it pretty hard last year and unsuccessfully um but actually i got a whole podcast that documents my lousy season uh, i was hoping i was hoping to document my co-founder's first turkey and we ended up just documenting a lot of car trips out to a, a hunting lot. No, but that, actually, I'm, I'm kidding. It's like a really good – it's a really good pro- podcast because he talks about how he thinks it's going to feel to be a hunter for the first time. Like, well, the, and, and then he goes through that whole thing of you know debating, am I a hunter? And, and my answer was, yeah, you, you, you've gone – this is what it is most of the time. We actually don't kill. Like it's like you go out and you, yeah. you don't come back with anything. This is – you're going to face this more than you typically will or like going out and bringing something back. So – but uh, no, it's a good show for, for kind of that that uh, kicking turkey season off, getting excited about it. Yeah, no, that's that's funny. That I my last season was similar to that. With I had had some really successful years like leading up to it, and I almost got cocky with myself. I got two tags. I'm like, you know, this is gonna be great, and I missed one turkey, and I hunted my ass off, and, and ended up not even filling a tag, which was kind of the story of my whole 2018 year in general. But it's uh, it's that's that's hunting. That's that's what yeah, it goes, it, you know. It is, man. And I was in the same boat. I was coming into my third season. I was much better at calling. I was uh, on a property that I knew was loaded with turkeys first day we get out there and uh call in three toms and i little did i know that was the closest i'd get to them uh in that season but you know i was trying to let chris take the first shot and i couldn't range them and we're looking at it and 50 yards is about what we figured they were but after the fact but i mean that feels like a long way especially to a first-time hunter and so he didn't take the shot and i didn't have a shot and, and like that ended up being our best look at it uh so i had a a relatively disappointing turkey year. actually my my hunting season last year was pretty slow overall i mean um i'm sure we're going to talk about go wild here in a little bit that is what i do but um you know running a hunting app um outdoors app has actually kept me out of the outdoors a little more than maybe i was able to do in the past but when you when you have your own company and and as you know as your brand's growing uh you know there there is no like shut it off at five it, it extends and uh, a lot of times unfortunately you know that that's part of the the downside of being an op- entrepreneur is you, you have responsibilities that you don't get to shut off when you leave work so um there's a lot of people depending on what we do uh user from the, the people that use the product and our families and um i don't i don't have the ability to do that so it kept me out of the woods a little bit this year 
Yeah, no, I'm I'm learning that as as you said, like you said, as as I grow and and do more stuff and try to you know make some of my visions become a reality. I'm learning that that has definitely broken into my time, you know, outdoors when I used to every day after work, I'd go shed hunting. I'd had no responsibilities, it seemed like, and, and everything in the spring. And, and now that's, that's changing a little bit. Let's put it that way to, to put it. Lightly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, but the, what, what I've noticed is the, the amount of time, like I don't have time to go run trail cameras like I used to. And I used to love running trail cameras and go out and run, you know, four or five of them if I could get them on a property where I was hunting and, and spend time just going out and scouting and aimlessly, like you said, kind of, uh, you know, just spending time doing all that. And I missed that for sure. But what I've, what the trade off has been, you know, last year while I didn't get to do um, as much kind of the aimless scouting, like, you know, just kind of slow learning. I had a lot of high impact fun and uh, I, I think of my trip to uh, Alaska, got to go up with a client and got paid to fish um, for four days, like and do photography with them and social media content. So that was really fun. Um, you know, I'd never been to Alaska. I'd never been salmon fishing and uh, I got to do it again in the, in the summer, had a go wild community member who I've gotten to know. He took me out. Uh, thank you, Mike. And Mike took me out and, uh, we went fishing on Lake Michigan and then I got to go down to Texas as part of a go wild sweepstakes and spend four days down there hunting with Jeremiah Dowdy and, um, you know, learning about his process of how he butchers and, and food is something I'm passionate about as, as you know. Um, so that was, that was really cool. Like that's, that's not something I would have gotten to do outside of it. So I do recognize that I've put myself in a position and, and to where, you know, there are times that I have sacrifices, but also I, I know I get to do some cool stuff. Like the, it, there's definitely times where I'm like, this, this is pretty, pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I completely agree with that. And, and yeah, and then the, the people listening right now are probably like, okay, assholes, you guys get to do all this awesome stuff or get to, you know, <laughs> you know, have, you know, some sort of a, a job in the outdoor industry or as your case, a living. And that so it might sound you know like we're complaining but we're not and it's definitely well, uh you know sounds that way for it <laughs> yeah sure it sounds that way but like i spent my day in keynote today building proposals like it's it's just not what people think it is like in a lot of ways um i have a product that i'm trying to get to a market and in the same way that before when i was in advertising you know no matter what that product was for my client like i was doing the same type of stuff now i just get to like it, it does closely overlap in a lot of ways. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we, we are all responsible for allocating the time that we want to put into this. Now, some people have more time, uh, CEOs of, of big companies. I'm talking, I'm not talking my company. I'm talking like a big, big company. You know, they're, they're going to be the people that have to come in and pay a guide. Um, some people that don't get to work in the outdoors industry, they might have the luxury to spend that time, you know, scouting out. We, you've that your whole journey has kind of been like figuring out the the Western pursuit. You know, you might have time to go out and spend twelve days in the backcountry, um, or or to hunt like you do with with whitetail and to really get out on foot and get out to where nobody else has gone. Like that kind of stuff takes time, and so you and I might look at those people and be actually really jealous of the time that they are able to put in because they are are working a job that allows them to shut it off. You know, I mean, it goes both ways. Certainly, um, you know, my thing is just taking the time, no matter what role you're in, to get outside and to enjoy it. Because I, I think there's, it, it probably sounds ironic being the CEO of a, a platform or an app, if you want to reduce it down to that. Um, you know, apps spent required screen time, right? Like, but I actually value getting people inspired to go outside and shut off their phones. I hope you put your phone in your backpack and don't look at it. You know, I hope you get out and experience that. So, um, I, I hope everybody, no matter which side of that fence you're on can get out and enjoy the outdoors. Yeah, no, definitely. And I guess before we go down too much of a, a rabbit hole here, Brad, we probably should, you know, introduce you and tell you, tell uh, the audience who you are and, and kind of what you do. Yeah. Um, Brad Luttrell, I am the CEO and co-founder of Go Wild. Go Wild is an activity tracking and social media platform for outdoors enthusiasts. We very much have started in a hunting specific space because that's where we're really seeing the need. I mean, people uh, that that are, most people that are using Instagram or Facebook are are certainly starting to notice if you're in that hunting space. There's a certain bias against these activities that exist. Um, that can be in the type of people you're going to run into. But it also is in the platforms themselves. I mean, there, 
the community uh, standards or community content guidelines, they're actively blocking, banning, and censoring hunting content. And not only just from the, you know, a lot of that's happening on the advertising side, but it's getting to the point where posted and shared content is getting censored, it's getting blocked, it's getting deleted, accounts are being deleted. And, you know, it, it, there's, it, it kind of opened up, and I got into this before we ever got into the level that it is now, but it opens up the question of like, where does this stop? You know, at what point is it going to become so sensitive that these um, platforms use artificial intelligence or, you know, image recognition, which is a totally thing. I mean, this is like an easier, like it's not easy, but it's fairly easy at a company of that size to implement to where they can tell you that this is a hunting photo, we're not going to allow your, your content at all. Like they could do that now if they want to. So what's, if the, if the thing uh, that you love most is against their platform's rules and they wanted to implement that technology, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go to connect with like-minded people? So the, the, the thing that we do is bring this group together in a place that is, it operates like a forum. You have a platform where you can post about the topics you love. If you're into elk hunting or deer hunting or firearms or running state parks, nature photography, um, DIY. We have a ton of woodworkers on our platform using it to talk about something they love. You know, you can use that to connect with like-minded people. And I think that's really important in, in today's society when, uh, for, especially for a, uh, more con misunderstood conservative market that is seeing their content banned, censored, and deleted on these other platforms. We give them a voice, we give them a place where they can connect freely. And what comes with that you know, it's, it's kind of funny. You let your guard down because you're not having to be defensive all the time. And, and people just naturally get back to being nice. They naturally get back to helping people. They are answering each other's archery questions or their muzzle loader questions. And they're diving into stuff that they care about again. And all of a sudden, we're not having to argue with the vegans about, you know, why our way of life is actually more sustainable. You know, you can put my... And I, I don't want to say that those conversations aren't important. You know, a, a common question I get when I do these interviews is, well, yeah, but you're building a, a network that's creating an echo chamber. And, and my response to that is, you know, that's not our goal. Like my goal is to give you a place where you can talk about your story in a more raw and realistic way. And then I hope you take this and we'll, we'll uh, use your other platforms and Instagram, for example, to teach your other uh, followers uh, a way or uh, your way of life in a way that they might find it appealing. You know, if, if you're a hunter, for example, that might mean that you use Go Wild to tell the more raw story about your field dressing your deer or showing your trophy post. But then when you're talking about hunting on your other platforms, you know, talk about the adventure aspect of it. Talk about the views you're seeing. Talk about what it was like to hear the woods wake up around you. And then sharing, you know, you can share even there's certain, I think there's tasteful images in, in trophy photos. And then there's trophy photos that we all know are going to rub people the wrong way, you know, share, share the story of hunting that you would want to tell people about. And I think if we use go wild to give us to, to capture that raw story and your other platforms to, you know, tell the story in a way that's going to essentially be a good advocate for what you want to do. Uh, I think there's a, a great harmony to be found in there. I certainly don't want to create those echo chambers. You know, we hope to enrich uh, your, your hunting or what fishing, whatever your experience is that you're pursuing with go wild. I hope you find enrichment through our platform. And I'm sorry, man, I get really excited. I'm not really great all the time at short answers. I just start talking about all this stuff, which I, <laughs> I, I, I like. <laughs> I'm like, what did he even ask me about? I'm just <laughs> going on and on now. No, that's that makes that makes my job easier. Okay, so that, yeah. <laughs> that works. Well, we got two we got two podcasters here. I'll probably be interviewing you by the end of this. Yeah, we'll see that's, how it goes. <laughs> I know. I'm not I'm not usually a very good guest either from <laughs> that standpoint. But what you brought up there was an interesting perspective. So you know, you're talking about with Instagram, like say you're using that to show like the experience and and almost you know educating people on you know why you're doing it from the standpoint of that and not being so um i guess in your face type of stuff where the way i look at go wild is almost like you're in a you're at a hunting camp with all your buddies and it's the yeah. stories that you would share there and uh you know the photos that you would share there because like you know i'll send pictures um say i kill a deer i'll send pictures to all my friends in a text message that i'm not going to post on instagram there might, right. you know, it might be the first one I walk up to and there's, you know, the tongues hanging out and there's blood down it. And I'm not saying those are good ones to share all around, but the, the idea is 
that that you can you can be a little bit more raw through it because you're surrounded by people that understand it already. You're not trying to educate, you know, on that on that topic as much. If 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 that uh, makes any sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Context is everything, man. Um, you know, I come from advertising. I, we didn't. I don't think I disclosed that in my really long winded answer. Um, but the before I was started go wild, I w- I was a creative director at an ad agency, and in our advertisements, you know, you can't. The a copywriter's job is to decide at what point in the narrative to start telling the story. You know, the movie that starts off ten years before the drama actually hit. You know, you you your your hero of the movie. Uh, let's say it's a 35 year old male. If you start, you know, 15 years ago when they're going through puberty and it's like you tell this story about how they got bullied at school and how they went and played soccer and then they went to music class. It's like, wow, that's really boring. You know, (laughs) that's not that's not when the movie starts. You find the point the right point to start telling the story when it's like, oh, man, somebody just got kidnapped and now he's got all of his guns and he's chasing the bad guys. It's like that's that you hit somebody at the right point. And they catch your attention and they have context of, you know, you're, you're learning about that person's background and context as the movie goes forward. Telling your story is no different. You know, you want to tell it in a way that's interesting, but you also want to tell it in a way that has context of like, this is why I do this. The adventure portion I talked about, that's something everybody, you talk about it so much. Like there's so much to be gained from just walking around. Uh, you know, I saw your post about you, 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 how much you learn just from being out in the snow because you can track deer differently in the snow and, and you learn something, you took something away from that and you didn't kill anything, but that's still part of the hunting process, right? Like yeah. when you go, when you go home tonight, if you cook a, um, you know, you get out a shank roast and you're going to, you're going to uh, throw that on the crock pot. Well, first, actually, first of all, if you're cooking a shank roast at like eight o'clock at night, I'm sorry, you're gonna, you got a great breakfast that'll be ready for you. Um, that was a bad example. <laughs> um, but let's say, let's say backstrap, let's say a backstrap. If you're going to throw a backstrap on the grill tonight, like that, that's a part of your hunting story to tell these things within the context of like why hunting is important to you and to show it from those angles, I think is one of the best things that we can do for, for hunting and, and advocating uh, a positive light on it. When, when we're only sharing those photos you talked about, and even if you want to talk about a tasteful grip and grin, you know, um, if you want to post only your, your grip and grins from, from your, your hunting adventures, you're only showing the death and listen, death is part of it. Like I, it, it, it's totally in order to eat it, you have to kill it. As far as I know, I have not found a way around that part yet. Um, but the, you know, if you're, if you're going to get, uh, only show that part of it, don't be surprised when people come up and call you a killer. You know, it's like, that's the part of the story you, you told. So if you want to talk about being a conservationist, which a lot of hunters like to throw that in the face of anybody that approaches them, my only problem with that is like, well, for the record, you didn't tell any other part of the story except the dead thing. Like, you know, you have to kind of lead, you have to lead in with the part that, uh, or the part you lead in with is what other people are going to remember. So I think, I think a, a lot of our platform offers the ability to have context around, We like you're in a platform where people get it. Like you don't have to set that up. We're starting at a further point in the story. So to go back to my movie analogy, you know, we're now at the point of drama, like the, the thing has died and we can all talk about that in a way because we understand it. But maybe you needed more context on these other platforms. You had to start the story a little sooner or you had to tell a little bit beyond the drama of the death. Like, hey, this is why this is important to me because I eat this. You know, I think we have to look at these platforms differently. Um, It's kind of funny, man. I've had people tell me that they, well, nobody ever complained about my grip and grins before. It's all these soft millennials. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, Our generation actually invented social media and best I can tell, you didn't have any way to share your photo of your dead deer with the vegans unless you were going to drive to their neighborhood and show it off or like drive your dead deer around their house. Like these things didn't happen before. OK, this is a very a fairly recent uh, problem that we've kind of walked into, in which case these these other the the anti hunters or, or these movements could could really be exposed so easily to our content. So in my opinion, we have, knowing that we have a responsibility to curate how we're uh, talking about hunting, how we're promoting this content and platforms like ours, there's other ones out there too, you know, whatever your platform of choice is to get in that with that like-minded group, you have a responsibility to work with that and to also tell a, a positive light around hunting. Otherwise, you know, don't be surprised if, uh, some of the predictions on, on hunting evaporating from states like Wisconsin, which is what, what's being predicted right now. Hunting may not exist in Wisconsin by 2050 at the rate, uh, of, of that we're losing hunters. You know, when, when that happens, you know, there's going to be an, I told you so moment, like this is, this is where it's headed if we don't make some cultural changes. Yeah, no, that, 
That's, uh, I mean, so what, as far as when you're looking at, okay, say the future of hunting and you're, you're, you know, highlighting some of these points that can be, you know, pretty bad and could go down that road. So are, are you saying that just, I'm trying to think how to ask this. So how are you thinking that, you know, we can slowly improve on this process? Is it through the, the way that we're using these apps and social media, or is there anything else that you're looking at to, again, improve this process and, and make sure that that doesn't happen for the, the future of hunting? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that are going on here. There's, there's, I'm going to start within our platform. So within our platform, you know, we have a trophy, um, setting like a, a functionality. You can load in an animal as a trophy. So I know I just kind of ripped on the trophy photo for a few minutes, but we actually have, you can go in and load your deer in right now. We're going to ask you for all kinds of data. We, we have a, I think it's 188 species that you can log in. We, we add uh, several more each month and you can go in and log these species. We're going to ask you for all your data and we're going to assign a score to it. So it's like, it's trophy hunting. Like this is a memory though, is how we look at it. So that has context. So within, you can use these other platforms uh, for that specifically, but we also see our platform responsibility is to pull out those other parts of the story. You know, we're going to ask you to share time, your time when you scout. So we have a functionality called logging time, or you can do the activity tracking within our app to say you were scouting. And, and this functionality within our platform it helps people learn the value, uh, the other important storylines that they're, they're not really sharing very well on other platforms. Uh, you know, a lot of times you go out and scout, you don't, a lot of times you don't get great photos. So one thing we're proud of with our platform, we don't require a photo to post. That's a big difference between us and Instagram. It sounds small, but it's actually huge for encouraging people to post actively on the app. There, that is a huge barrier to feel that I have to have a piece of photographic content that can live up to Instagram standards. I mean, good God, the amount of great visual content on that platform, it's incredible. I mean, they've done a great job at empowering photographers, but it's gotten to the point that a, a, it's actually a barrier. There's a lot of people that on that platform that are afraid to post because they don't want to be judged. They don't want their photos to, to, to not be able to live up to that of their friends. And, and there's actually psychology behind this. There's this whole competition that goes on to where now, you know, there's kind of the sad part of our, our millennial generation that's taking vacations to certain parts of the world to be able to post it and hashtag it like that that's happening that's been documented that people are doing that so <laughs> you got you got this total other flip side of that so like what we want to do is to encourage people to tell the other parts of their story without that beautiful photo so you, you know logging time helps show you like hey there's value and every time you go out and you get to scout hey the recipe we have a whole functionality for recipe you can post those uh, anything you want. I actually, I posted like, it doesn't have to be wild game. I posted a uh, pickled onion recipe on my uh, page the other day just cause it was good. And uh, you know, showing people though, like uh, you'll look in the cooking section or you'll see these recipes coming through for venison and rabbit. And it's, it's putting value on those other aspects. So I, my hope is through this platform, people are posting that on their recipes through go out. It's like, Oh, you know what? That's actually not that bad of a photo. I'm going to share this on my Instagram or Hey, this actually the sunset photo for my scout. That's pretty cool. Like you might've taken it just for your scouting photo for us, but I hope you share these other parts of the story elsewhere. Like a big part of our goal with our year round functionality, you know, it's not most, most hunting apps, they're going to spike in Q4 uh, for to use a business term. You're going to spike at the end of the year, when hunting season is in full swing, you know, whitetail drives by and large the uh, the demand for a lot of this stuff and elk hunting. So you're you're starting in September and come like into November and December, it's going to come down. But our apps activity actually does go year round, and and what we're seeing with that is uh you know a lot of people are are continuing to share their story. Uh, Mike, the guy I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite quotes I've seen from our platform was uh, he posted his trophy and he said. This picture uh, represents one 365th of my story. My go wild profile tells the rest. Like the, the experience of being a hunter is so much more than killing the animal. So I hope people will learn that through our platform that they're under, like we're prompting them to tell those other parts of the story. And then I think just coincidentally, it's going to bleed out into these other spaces. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a really good point. I mean, like, so like your app, that, that live activity tracking, that's something like I've never seen anywhere else. And, and before we start recording here, I said to you, I was like, I've always struggled. I love tracking data, which 
I mean, go wild is you could tell that you like to do that as well. <laughs> but yeah, we got to, I mean, my co-founder is a data scientist. So, yeah. uh, and then Chris, our developer, uh, interned at NASA, built four co- uh, apps for Coca-Cola. He did one with the Olympics. I mean, he was running a software for medications for senior homes. Like these, these guys are smart, man. Like they know, they know their stuff. Yeah, that, it definitely sounds like you have a good team working with you there. That's for sure. And yeah. like, that's just uh, me personally. I love data. I love being able to track stuff and, and everything else. And it was always a struggle for me because I wanted to track my scouting trips, but I didn't, you know, say for like when I would, you know, do running and uh, everything, I use an app called Strava. And, but it shows your map and where you went. I don't want people to see where I'm scouting, (laughs) you know, I don't want to see that. So I would never use it. And I always felt like it was a a law in my data, like that it didn't have this, you know, there's a gap there. And with, you know, go wilds activity tracking feature, it doesn't share the maps. Right. We share your map in the sense of like, this is the elevation you hiked at. This is the, it'll show you like if you walked a perfect circle, which nobody would do, but just use this as an example. I would look at your map and see a perfect circle, but I won't see things like uh, road names. I won't see topographic lines. You know, it's very generic. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm, we just met, uh, I just came out of a meeting. I want it to be even more generic just to continue to push that. And actually we're getting ready to roll out the ability. If you want to disable your map entirely, we'll take anything off. Like right now it still shows some major roads, but you can't zoom out. So it's like only if you were to hike next to one, you can't zoom out from, from the, uh, the orientation, but you know, I, we're going to make it to where if you take out the map entirely, all you can see is that shape that you walked. And then as I scroll through, I can see photos you took. I can see your heart rate if you're using the Garmin integration. Uh, if you're not, we'll still be able to see your elevation and you can see that go up and down. So it, it, it's telling your story in a way that you've not been able to do before. So you're talking about it on the scouting side, but imagine on the hunting side, this turkey season, if people use our activity tracking, so I pull out my app, hit the plus sign, hit activity tracking, hit hunting, boom, put my phone back in my pocket. As I'm going through and taking photos, you know, you just randomly pull out your camera, you take a photo of a skull you found, or you take a photo of the sunrise, it's going to pull all that into your timeline because it knows where you were. So what's cool about this from a scouting perspective for you, you can go back and look at this and say, oh, here's where I found this shed. Here's where I found uh, this bedding site. And you'll be able to see all this in a way that's relevant to you. But to everybody else, it's just eye candy. You know, they get to yeah. see your story in a way that maybe they couldn't have before. And then on the hunting side, man, I cannot wait for turkey season because we finally got enough people using these garments within our platform and uh, the, the live tracking that we're actually going to be able to see heart rates spike when the turkeys start gobbling. You know, if you're like me, like first day out that I hear turkeys gobble, my heart rate goes through the roof. And traditionally, what have we told people when we tell our friends like, man, my heart rate was, I thought the deer was going to be able to hear my heart. It was beating so hard. Well, now that conversation, thanks to the Go Out platform, that conversation is, dude, my heart rate jumped 30 beats per minute when I heard that first gobble. Uh, or like my, what, if it's a white tail it, for me, it'd probably be like, dude, I thought I was going to die. My heart rate jumped up to 178. You know, like you'll be <laughs> able to tell those metrics and have data in a, in a uh, more meaningful way. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to turn uh, hunting into such a numbers game that like it's, it's, it's like playing fantasy baseball or anything here, but we are trying to help you relive a memory. And I'm trying to help you share that memory in, in a way that's never been done before. And, uh, you mentioned Strava, like that's a great example. If anybody's familiar with Strava or Runkeeper, but but those platforms are more, you know, they are conducive to hiking, to biking, to running. They're not conducive to the way that hunters see their their activity. They don't look at things like, uh, you know, one thing we want to integrate is gear tracking. You know, uh, that's something that's commonly done. I'm not revealing anything too proprietary here. Um, with, with Strava and Runkeeper, you can track your shoes. Like I want to add the ability to track gear. So like, that's something we're going to be looking at this year is how do we use this platform to help you track and see what, what you got out of your boots? Like, you know, how, how, uh, how many, how many miles did you get on those boots versus your last ones? We're going to start, we'll be the platform that has that kind of data and it's going to be data that nobody else has. And with the amount of people we have using the platform, my hope is that we can start to compare this data so that for, you know, brands can use it to learn from, but more than, more importantly than anything, our community members can use it to, to look at it and say, okay, 
um, it looks like on average this brand does better. Or, you know, my buddy uh, Bo, he uses this brand. I know he logs a lot of miles each year um, because I can see this on his profile. I'm going to buy those boots. You know, that that's really the direction we're hoping to take all that data that we're collecting. Um, and, and when I say that brands can use this, like our vision is for like seeing how people you can interact with this to see what people actually want. Like, don't we all want products to cater to us? I mean, wouldn't you rather buy a product made by hunters instead of product developers who aren't hunters? I mean, that to me, that makes total sense. It's going to move things along. It's going to be an evolution in gear uh, because we're tracking that data in a way that nobody's ever catered to before. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I like that, like, especially like thinking like you said, like the boots or something, just to be able to see or or be like, wow, I put you know seven hundred miles on this pair of boots. Like these are a good, you know, a good set. And it or the flip of that, it's like, man, I've had these for three years, but I only logged like two hundred miles on them. These things were crap. You know, yeah, you, you want to know that stuff. Or or uh, yeah, I only logged this many miles. No wonder I gained fifteen pounds. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's something we're looking at doing too, is the, to be able to motivate. So we've done some of this on our platform. Every now and then we'll send out a push of like, hey, it is it's turkey turkey season's here. Get your butt outside. But we'll be able to start customizing those motivating uh, promotions or tweets or not tweets, uh, push notifications. I do love Twitter for the record. Like I'm not going to apologize for it. Uh, but but the, <laughs> the push notifications, um, you know, we'll be able to customize those to to you personally. So if we know that typically Bo scouts five times a month, but he hasn't scouted in like six weeks, we're going to be a platform that cares about you and cares about getting you back outside. So we're going to send a push to say, Hey Bo, you know, it's been a while since you, you've gotten active, man. Maybe it's time to go run or time to go hike or time to go scout, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like that. That, that would be a, a really good addition to it. And so like with, with that, you've also, you talked about a little bit there, your integration with Garmin. So how does that, so how is your integration with Garmin, you know, affecting one, this activity tracking and everything else as far as being active? Yeah. The, so to, there's two different types. I kind of talked about the, uh, activity tracking within hiking, running, um, scouting within our platform from Garmin's perspective, but we, we built a, with Garmin, we built a custom platform or a custom app within the watch that actually um will track your archery this is uh this has been one of the coolest things that i've ever worked on personally the device actually mimics it it understand we, we we knew we wanted to build something that would not be obtrusive you know i don't want to i don't want to build something that you gotta like fiddle with while you're shooting a bunch so we knew we had to minimize the amount of interactions you needed to take with this device but also provide enough value that you'd want to do it, right? So the first thing it does, it just asks very simply, like, what's your distance? And then it, using the watch, you, you know, you, you're, you're using this. I'm, I'm right-handed, so uh, I'm holding the bow with my left hand. So the watch is on my left hand. It looks for things, and it like when my wrist rotates, there's an accelerometer within the watch. So what an accelerometer is, anybody that's got an a iPhone – when you, when you pick up your iPhone, what does it do? The screen comes on because it knows you picked it up. You probably want to see your screen. So the watch has that same technology inside of it. So the accelerometer knows when I turn my wrist to hold my bow up. It waits for that lift. It waits for a hold. It looks for the string vibration so it can actually feel the slight vibration of your bow. And it waits for the drop. There's a few other things it looks for in there. But, but overall, there's like this combination of activity that it looks for to know that a shot has been completed. So if anybody's familiar with the Garmin Zero bow sight that came out, that that device, uh, how that bow sight, how it has the shot detection in it, we did the same thing with the watch. Um, the watch does not have quite the acceler the, the the Zero bow sight. It's an incredible piece of technology. So that thing is very sensitive. It knows uh, it has a lot a much faster accelerometer, um, but the the watch has a really good one. And so we were actually able to to pick with with pretty damn good accuracy, man. I mean, honestly, like I tried to fake it when I was showing people at ATA and I, I think I faked it once over three days of showing, you know, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and a hundred people, the, the actual watch app. Um, so, so you, if it does have a false positive or it doesn't catch it, uh, you can actually plus or minus your shots. So you track your shots. Let's say I shot four arrows. 
Next thing you're going to do is what? You're going to walk down and get your arrows. So the, the watch will actually prompt you to take a photo with your phone. You're going to take a photo of the bag with your phone, which no big deal. A lot of people do that anyways, right? So, and, and that's not with our app. That's just taking a photo. So you're going to pull your arrows out. It's going to ask you how you did. So right now it's set up more around, um, you know, the way hunters shoot. We're shooting groups. Um, we don't have target archery in there necessarily with the five targets. Uh, we're looking at how to integrate that better with the, within our app. Um, I don't necessarily want to go full bore like scoring system. So we're trying to figure that out. Uh, but right now it's really cool for how most of our, our users would, would consider that, that functionality. So, uh, you do this loop. So you're going to start over. Are you, if it's going to assume that you're shooting the same distance, if you're not boom, boom, I'm, I'm up to, to 10 more yards out. I'm now shooting 40 yards and the whole process goes through again. So you're going to save that activity just like you would with any other Garmin app. And it, uh, it's going to kick it over to our platform which is where the magic happens. It, it's going to pull together all those photos you took. It's going to pull together your heart rate, which it was tracking without really like you doing anything. You, you, uh, it's going to pull together all the information you logged. And we show you group one, you shot 20 yards, three inch grouping. Here's your photo. Here's your heart rate. Here's your elevation. So group two, you, we do this for however long you go. And it, it tracks all this data and it shows it in a timeline. And as you scroll, you can see those photos you can so so like you know gone are the days of trying to explain. I see people doing this on Instagram all the time. And I'm like, dude, you just need to go wild app. Um, the uh, first first shot is 20 yards at uh, you know I, I shot this group. Uh, second photo, I was shooting 60 yards, and it's like they they spend the entire caption trying to explain what they did. Well, our app does that now, and you can do this on the phone. You don't need the Garmin app. You can actually track in the exact same way. The only thing it doesn't do is the heart rate tracking. Um, you, you, you input how many times you shot or it doesn't do the art, uh, the auto detect either you put in, you, so you'll just quickly like tap after you shoot. So you don't do it in between shot. Well, I guess you could, but you, you, uh, will just shoot your time. So, okay, pick it up, shot four times. I'll go get my stuff. And, um, uh, it's awesome, man. I mean, like it, it truly has, uh, I've had a lot of people tell me that like, I love, love this functionality because, I can see target panic creeping up and you can't, uh, I, I was even skeptical of how much this would really be valuable on the data side of things. But I'll see people talking about like, man, the end of the session, I just wasn't shooting well. And, um, I, I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, well, I do your, your heart rate was up 30 beats per minute versus when you started, like you were getting tired, you know, it's like, you can see these things from the data side and, you know, from, from an archery standpoint, I've, I've just started shooting last year. And, um, for the first time on the archery side, uh, I've always hunted rifle and shotgun. I've never really been uh, a bow hunter. So I've been, I've been learning all this. And I, one thing I know about archers is they love data. So to me, what we're providing to you is a chance to learn from your shoots, even, even in the sense of like capturing the shoot. Cause a lot of times I'll look back and be like, I don't know, I feel like I shot pretty good, but, but now you can look back and you have all your photos in a line. It streamlines everything in the order you shot it. It has your data of like what yardage was. Um, you know, if you want to learn and push yourself to get better, this is, this is a wonderful tool to be able to use and, and do that. Yeah, no, that's, that's so, that's so cool to be able to do that. And like you said, you can go back and look at it and see how you've progressed throughout the year and, you know, and then, and then identify those issues because like target panic is one of those things that I think just about every archer deals with at some point in their, you know, career, whether they recognize it or not. And this will help you recognize it and then be able to, you know, work on it and fix it through, you know, other applications and, and, well, you know, getting it down to the tar- basics. Yeah. And target panic is one of those things. It's like, what really is it? You know, is it psychological? Are you having a physiological response to it? My early what I'm seeing early, like there's a physiological response that comes with target panic. When you get nervous, what, what does your heart rate do? You know, your heart rate starts to uptick. And so we can actually see that on the data side of things. Um, it's really, it's interesting, man. I mean, um, even if you don't have a Garmin, which I mean, look, these watches aren't cheap. Nobody, no, Garmin doesn't deny that. I don't pretend they are cheap. Um, but, but if you have a compatible watch, great. If you don't, there's still a lot to learn from, from tracking, you know, if you don't measure, how can you know if you're being successful or otherwise it's just all gut. It's like what feels good. Well, what feels good doesn't really help you move along. It doesn't help you become a better, uh, art, archer overall. So one thing we're looking at doing just like tracking the shoes I mentioned or the boots, you know, we're looking at doing this with archery. Uh, my hope is by the end of the year, we're going to be able to tell you how, how many times you shot this year. 
uh, you know, how many arrows you fired and to be able to start to give you observations along the way. So um, just like we want to load in your boot setup, I really want to be able to integrate your bow setup so that eventually I can tell you um, observations based off of what the community is doing. So the community's data, collective data is going to help you become better individually at what you're doing. So I can say, hey, Bo, um, you know, you're shooting 80 pounds, man. But you know what? People that shoot 70 and up, they typically don't kill any more elk or deer than than people uh, that are shooting 80. Like 80 doesn't help you at all. So maybe consider lowering your, your poundage. I'm just making stuff up. But those are the kind of observations we might have once we have the data and are actually able to start an- analyzing that. And, and you can't do that if you don't track it. You know, I mean, but one thing we're seeing, I mean, I, just out of the gate. We just launched this in January. Um, the adoption's there. I mean, we're definitely going to be able to make those assumptions and, and, and build on it from there. I mean, we're still early in the game. Uh, our platform's only been out. Or our, our, we launched on iOS in September 2017. So we're not that old. Um, but at the rate we're growing, it definitely looks like the traction's there, the adoption's there on the, the live activity tracking. And like you said, nobody's done this in this space before. So Um, to me, once the, I mean, we're still in that like early phase where I know most people have never heard of us. So as, as that word gets out and the utilities there and people are finding value in it and really start to share, um, I think as that scales by the end of the year, we could have a really valuable resource for archers to be able to learn from and, and use as a tool to get better. Yeah. I, so I, I have two comments on this one. I wanted to go back to when you're talking about the, um, the target panic issue. So I, it, completely unrelated to your app, but I had done a a research article, I think it was last year on this topic. I struggle with it and still do at points. And I was working with uh, Heather Kelly from Heather's Choice, uh, the Backcountry Meals, about how I, I realized that I was struggling with it depending on what I was eating and how I was eating and if I was eating and everything else and, you know, would affect my shooting. And she helped me from the you know standpoint of, you know, being a nutritionist and understanding the, that side of it, how you can correlate target panic to your diet and your nutrition. And that was super interesting, you know, depending on what your blood sugar levels are and, you know, the different types of foods you're eating and caffeine and everything else and how that affects it, which again, that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but I just wanted to to bring that up. It's it's pretty interesting. Once I started really digging into it and where I was going with it is, you know, this live activity tracking, say you were using um, a Garmin watch in the process and you're able to, you know, test your heart rate, you could look back at that data and maybe, maybe most people don't care about it, but I know if there's anybody out there that's like me and, and I'm sure like you, Brad, you know, you'd, you'd be able to correlate that be like, all right, I didn't have time to eat before I shot leagues tonight or shot in the yard. And this is what happened. Or I, I had, uh, you know, I just went to the gym and I drank a pre-workout drink and then I went to shoot and this is what happened, you know, and, and just try to correlate that stuff, which is, I guess, um, endless in the, the route that it kind of seems like you're going here. But. Yeah, it is. But I mean, one like runners look at their their resting heart rate and your max heart rate and you're trying to figure out max effort. You know, how hard should I be pushing myself? We're going to be able to do all that with our platform. I mean, again, this is super early, man. We're talking like you look at like Facebook's when they launched. Uh, I don't know if you were on the pl- I was on the platform in 2005. It launched in launched uh, mid 04, I think. So I was pretty early in the game. It was a pretty relatively bare bones product. Um, I obviously you can't launch that bare bones today and have a product, a social media product. And we didn't, uh, we obviously launched more similar to probably what they had in like 2007, but we are that early in what we're doing. And I'm telling you that not to be cocky or to, you know, glow. I'm just telling you with what I know that we have on our roadmap, we have our next five years planned out. Like we know where this thing is going. This is not like a, I see so many people, uh, that have tried to do this before, talk about wanting to build Facebook for the outdoors. And I'm like, man, that's already been done on Facebook. I mean, how many hunting groups are there? How many, uh, you know, hunting pages are there? If you're trying to be Facebook in the outdoor space, that's not enough. You have to be 10 X better. That's the only way people will give you their most valuable resource, which is not their money. It's their time. And if, if you want to be a platform that people use, uh, 
you know, one of the digital platforms they're going to use when they're out hunting, if they're out, when they're out doing their activity, they love when they're checking, you know, uh, in between when you're in the waiting room at, at the doctor, the thing you go to, to, to cruise on and to, uh, or when you have a question, if you want to be that, you got to be good, man. Like, and if you, if you want to be, and you, if you want to be good, you got to have something that adds value and something that is unexpected and, and something that they can't get anywhere else. So, uh, w- with our team, we know this, we, we, we honestly, like, it's funny because, every, you know, I do these interviews and, and everybody's like, dude, that's so cool. You know, you guys are innovative, blah, blah, blah. And, and I literally just came out of a meeting in which Chris is like, dude, I'm sorry, we're moving so slow. You know, it's like, we just launched Garmin two months ago and he's apologizing to me because we're moving slow. Not like, Oh, I'm so, it's not like I'm a tyrant leader or anything, but he, he wants to move faster. We all want to move faster. Um, I mean, we're just, we're super early in, in what's going to be possible. I promise anybody that's, you know, still using the platform in December, will look back and, and see like, Holy crap, this is way different. Bo, were you in go wild before the redesign? No, I was not. No, I don't we, think we, I was. We already, uh, we just launched that in January. So it was like right the day I, before I met you, um, we, we completely dumped everything we had done and started over and re- redesigned the entire app. I mean, obviously we didn't do it that day, but, uh, it was like th- th- three months of development work to completely scrap a product that had been on the market for like a little over a year. Um, and that, that's our style. Like we, we, we said, you know what? This could be better. We did focus groups with uh, some of our brand ambassadors and found out uh, a couple things that we could improve. And we had observations ourselves. We use the product. I think that's an important thing to note. Like we're not just designing this from a, a be pretty standpoint as designers. Uh, a lot of our competitors have tried that have come and gone, honestly, have tried to do this by paying an agency to do it. And that doesn't work. That's expensive. And you're paying people at the end of the day to design something that aren't hunters or um, don't, don't live the product like we do. And, uh, you know, we, we saw an opportunity to improve. So we scrapped the entire thing. We rebuilt our whole website and, uh, re- redesigned and relaunched an Android and an iOS app. Now there was some hiccups like Android kind of sucked at first. Like we had some bugs out of it, but like we, we move very fast and we assume that things will be broken, um, sometimes and, and we're just going to fix that stuff and, and, and continue to iterate. And that ultimately is what's good for our audience is to, you know, put out a more sophisticated product, even if it means a couple bugs here and there. Then we come back and clean that stuff up. But, you know, my focus here is to provide something of value. I'm, I'm honored that tens of thousands of people would use our product, but I'm not going to be egotistical and assume that they'll be here if we just kind of let it ride out from here. You know, they're not. That's not how this works. Yeah, no, especially in today's world where it seems like, uh, you know, attention spans are even shorter. So, you know, if, if you're right. not growing with it, you know, and, and going with the times and you get, you get passed up pretty quickly. So that's, that's awesome to hear that you did that. And no, I, I don't think I was, um, on the app before that, cause I don't think I was until, until ATA show. And yeah, um, so, so unless you're uh, Android, uh, we missed that deadline just a hair, but unless you're on Android, you wouldn't have seen it. It would have, cause I think by the, we launched iPhone two days before I met you. I think it was like right before. So, okay. Android's yeah. caught up now, but I mean, uh, well, for the most part, there's a couple little things we're, we're tweaking out, but, uh, yeah. So one thing that I've noticed by, you know, using the app here only for, you know, a few short months now is the amount of engagement that you get through it. And yeah, tell me about that. I'm curious, like, what what is uh, – see, I did it. Here we go. Uh, what is your experience <laughs> on uh, posting on Go Wild? And, and uh, as, a, as someone – you have a pretty good following on your Instagram account. So, like, give me a comparison. Yeah, so I – you know, yeah, my Instagram account, you know, does pretty well from that standpoint. And the Go Wild account's brand new. So it's not like, right. you know, that there's a lot of people that, you know, follow me on there or anything. But – when I post something or, you know, ask a question, it's like getting a ton of comments and, you know, like good, you know, constructive comments and feedback of people that really want to help and are, you know, giving their input and putting their time into it. And just, it, it's, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like it, again, I, I th- figured it was going to be, oh, this is starting brand new with, you know, an app. It's going to take a while for people to see your stuff and everything. And it's so did we. <laughs> not that, and it's not that way. You I mean, you yeah. can, you could have be someone on there, say like you, that has X amount of people that see it. And then there's someone like me that's new and you know, I'm still getting a ton of engagement. And that's, that's awesome. And yeah. to be able to see that and, 
I, I can't even begin to explain that the the gratitude I have for the love of the podcast on there with your podcast sharing feature. Um, yeah, that's but, a cool thing that nobody else is doing too. Yeah. Did you kind of want to exp- – uh, uh, did I answer your question there fully? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I'll, 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 I've obviously had more conversations around um, the experience there than you have. So I'll give a couple of more examples. Um, I've talked to some big brands and they're like, oh, cool. We're, we're uh, you know, yeah, we're interested in po- like we want to cr- start creating content on it. And I'll, I'll tell them like, look, I'm looking at your page right now and you're with well, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. I'm like, you're getting like, you know three to five comments a post. I guarantee if you'll post the same stuff, like don't, I'm not even asking for you to be to put any more effort in carbon copy this over to our platform. I guarantee we can beat it. Now I am very open of people like, Hey, if you're in this for vanity likes, like which are totally, I, I almost wish we didn't have upvotes. Um, they, they are nice to, to be able to like, let people know you saw something, but overall I think it starts to make our platform try to compete with the vanity of Instagram which is driven by bots. It's driven. I mean, have you ever Googled bots for Instagram, like in, integrations that you could do like right now with your account, you can pay people to go out and comment for you. Like the, it's, it's insane. How, how, like yeah. The and I've noticed that when people do it online, you'll get the same thing like on everyone. Oh, it's fake. It's like great. I love your gallery. It's yeah. like some, you know, it's like something that doesn't make sense for what you posted. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be but, like, Oh, my dog just died. I love your gallery. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, or the, they'll, they'll say something like kind of, uh, that sounds almost like it was relevant. And then it's like, follow me please. Um, or, or it's just emojis that could mean anything. Um, you know, we don't want to try to compete on that. Like I, I tell brands all the time, like, look, if you want 300 likes, I'm, this isn't going to work out. Like, that's not what we're trying to do. But if you want real engagement, if you want engagement, that's meaningful and people that are curious about your product, this is a great place for you. Our, our gear reviews, uh, tra- trail, people will post, uh, asking for reviews and giving reviews and it'll turn on to full on debates with 20 comments on them. I saw a, a guy the other day, here's probably the best summary of this that I've seen. Uh, Andrew Robinson has about 14,000 followers on Instagram and he posted, uh, a re- he was asking questions about a bow site and he's a hunting account. So he posted the, the same picture in question on, on his Instagram account as he did go wild. And he got great engagement on Instagram. It's like 24 questions or 24 responses. They're shorter, but they were, you know, quick hit. Like, yeah, some of them were like nice pick, but I think most of them were, um, you know, uh, answering his question about the bow site. I, I think, I think on go wild, he got 75. The last I looked in 24 hours, 75 comments about the bow site. Wow. Three X, you know how many followers he has on go wild? 220. <laughs> it, it's like, that's our platform isn't followers don't matter. The reason you follow people is not to make their ego bigger or to let give to build that follower account. You'll notice on the profile, the follower is smaller than the, the, uh, the number, the score, your score is your, your thought leadership. Like the score is what's showing all those scouting trips, the recipes you upload, your, your, uh, trophies you load in, you know, we're look, starting to, we're going to start building in it, you know, as you comment, the podcast you listen to, all that stuff feeds into your score to show people that like I use this platform and also I am legit. So if you got 10,000 plus points, you're probably a pretty legit outdoorsman or you just listen to an ass load of podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, but, but really like truthfully, it really measures your outdoorsmanship. Uh, we don't care about your followers. And, and, and in Wes's case, you know, the, the fact that he had, uh, all those followers didn't matter. Our, the go out platform outperformed him because it's a forum. So the dude that has 200 followers on Instagram or 15,000, you know, they come into our platform. They have just as much chance of getting engagement. And we built the platform with this intentionally because Twitter, even today, their biggest challenge is getting you to follow enough accounts to find value in the platform. So we said, we don't want to deal with that. That's going to be insane. Trying to grow that as a new platform in a niche. Let's build this closer to a Reddit. If anybody's used Reddit, like there's forums you can follow in Reddit. And so we built it. So, you know, you, when you post into elk hunting, everybody that uh, follows elk hunting can see that post. And in fact, sometimes uh, we'll even take those that content and push it out. You know, we, we send about one push a day uh, of something really interesting from the app. So if it's an elk hunting post that we, we chose this day, you're going to get the elk hunting push. So you can see, like, I think today actually it was... Um, 
John Hunter for bass fishing. So I follow bass fishing. So they sent that to like wish John Hunter well. And he's fishing the FLW tour, which is like the NASCAR of fishing, if people don't know. Um, so John's my business partner and he's a pro fisherman too, but it was like a push for that. But sometimes I think, uh, one I recall recently was about a turkey mount. So everybody that follows turkey hunting, uh, would, would get that post. So it's always really relevant and it's always exposed to tens of thousands of people. So essentially people on go wild enter that platform and they immediately have the power of the amount of people that are active in the whole platform. You don't need followers. That's the biggest difference. Yeah, no, that's yeah. And then you don't, it's, it's not a, a game of trying to, you know, build that you're just putting out quality content and people right. are able to find that. Right. Exactly. Huh. I, I, I see that that was something that that's new to me too, is kind of how that all worked together. Like I said, yeah. I just had my limited experience with it, but I haven't even uh, dove into the app even, you know, even close to being like the, the gear side of things. I'm going to have fun with that. I love, you know, talking gear with people and everything and, and, you know, getting input so that I, I can't wait to dive into that side of it. Oh, uh, dude, we got gear junkies. I mean, I, I tell brands this when I'm talking to them. I'm like, look, if you want to find a, this is low funnel. And in the marketing world, that means ready to buy. People are making purchasing decisions on this platform because it's like, hey, guys, I'm down to looking at this muzzle loader and this one. What do you all think is best for this? Ex like very, very ex explicit scenario, like very, very explicit. And and they'll get 30 comments on this. Like it's insane. It kind of is insane how niche it is. I mean, like muzzleloader hunting in, in itself is niche, and then there'll be like another layer of some very specific applied um, application to it. So, you know, the, the the app does very well with those broad stroke um, types of questions. Though one thing right now, you know, one thing we want to be better at is geolocated. So I want to make it better for you in Pennsylvania and me in Kentucky and the guy out in California. And we're going to be getting there. Um, you know, the problem right now, I, I liken it to butter and toast. If you, if you have a lot of butter and you can spread it across the toast, you can taste it throughout, right? When you're new, the challenge with starting with anything, if I had that functionality right now, you would be disappointed because you would be able to search like your location and you might not get enough answers. For, so for me, it's better to open it up to the, the full audience because just because somebody isn't in your location doesn't mean they don't know whitetail hunting like you do. Like they might be just down the road in Virginia and they used to live in Pennsylvania or they might live out West now and they know how to hunt whitetail though. Like, so for us right now, it's actually better that it's not geo targeted. That's a request we get a lot, but it's coming. Trust us. It's coming. I mean, you guys, how long we've been talking for an hour about all the innovation the teams put into this. I think it, it's clear that we're going to do the things I'm saying we're going to do. Um, but right now, the best thing for the platform is actually to keep that very open and loose environment. I mean, look at elk hunting. Uh, Out West has the highest churn of non-residential tags uh, in, in the country because people are constantly going out there and hunting. So you have experts on elk hunting all over the country, not just Out West, you know? No, oh, yeah. That, that, yeah that's, that's exactly right. Huh. That So... And so it's funny when you said that about the, the geo location there, and I was thinking in my head, like, how can I, you know, find like, say, you know, link up with people that on there and, and, and see people's stuff that were in my area, but not, I understand what you're saying now. Yeah, we're going to get there. I mean, we, a lot of people, it's kind of funny because we get a lot of recommendations on functionality and people will say, Hey, I want a trail for my state. And it's like, well, that actually wouldn't be how you would want to do that. You would want to be able to filter per your topic, per your state. And, uh, you know, we, we're getting there. We, we're working on right now. One of the big things we want to do is get more zip codes listed in the app. Um, at first, we didn't require that. Uh, we're looking through how we, we figure out who you are. One thing, man, I'm like very transparent about. I, I don't want to become a platform that's like in a position of Facebook to where the amount of data they have on you is misunderstood. So right now we have a totally open platform. Uh, you can't do a private profile, everything like anybody can see anybody. And we've structured it that way really from a data privacy standpoint of like, look, this whole thing's open. You know, we don't have, I mean, your direct messages are yours, but um, you know, what you post is what you post. So, uh, you know, we, we're, tr we're trying to build a very open uh, environment that everything's very clear how this works. Um, and even when people ask me like, how do you guys make money? I'm like, well, right now we don't, but eventually it'll be advertising. And the benefit that we have is that, you know, uh, from, from the trails perspective, uh, the, all the forums that you do, I don't need to guess if you're an elk hunter or to creep on your direct messages to see if you've been talking about elk hunting. 
you already followed the elk hunting trail. That pretty much tells us you're an elk hunter, right? So, um, or, you know, or even, want to, <laughs> or want to, right? Or you're either way, you're relevant to an advertiser. So, so even that point of it, like it's there's nothing, there's nothing creepy going on there. And, and people, it's kind of funny because I, I think, um, you know. I, Part of us, we're always like, man, when we launch advertise, like the display ads, whenever we do that, people are going to be pissed. But actually, like it's the opposite. People respond, like people message us and they're like, man, I hope you guys are making enough money to keep this thing going because I love it. And they're like, they want us to put advertising into it because they know we need to make money to keep it going. So it, it's just been the most, my, my developer, Chris, always uses uh, this funny example. He's like, I have been a developer my whole life. I've been dealing with bugs in code my whole life. And typically you get a bug from people and they're pissed. Go wild. They apologize first for bothering you. They, they tell you profusely how much they love the product. They say, I almost didn't tell you this, but I just, you know, I'd really like to get this fixed. I'm so sorry for having to bother you. And then they tell you there's a problem in your code. And it's like, most people would be total dicks about this. They're just like, I can't believe them, blah, 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 blah. You know, but like our, our platform, Again, going back to how, how nice it is and how grateful everybody is, they do that even when they're reporting problems within our own code. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's just interesting. You know, we try to be open with them. And in turn, I do think that's built a lot of loyalty to our team. And that's not lost upon us. You know, I think when we if we put out a release that has some type of problem in it, we take that really seriously. We try to get something up very quickly to to address those problems because we take it to heart. You know, I'm not going to sleep as well at night knowing that people are wanting to use our platform and can or if they're wanting to ask questions because they're going on an elk hunt in two days and for some reason they can't post like that. I take that very personally and we're going to make that right. Huh. So it's it's funny like as i'm listening to this my business mind is kind of you know going in circles too i'm thinking geez how do you juggle all this <laughs> stuff your team you and your team is what i'm saying is it's you know it's moving extremely fast and then uh yeah and uh in an awesome direction you know it is like i said it gets me excited to see someone you know seeing that bigger picture and 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 you touched about it way back at the beginning of the podcast where you're talking about how you know facebook and instagram they're you know kind of filtering stuff and and you know i i tried there's some i had some ads i tried running to promote my podcast i did with Corey jacobson and they wouldn't let me run the ad because there was a mm. picture of an elk you know with you know that he had killed on a basically a trophy photo that i had as a cover photo and yeah yeah and i i couldn't i could not get that they would not approve it and you know so that stuff you know is going it's not going to get any better no so it's oh, it's actually gotten exponentially worse every quarter yeah well yeah and see i i don't see that i to me now that you know in the i guess it's been almost you know almost a year since i started east meets west um, now I'm a lot more open to it and seeing it more than I did in the past. And I'm sure a lot of people just don't notice it and, and see that, that that's happening and it's happening relatively quickly. Well, the thing that most, most people don't see that because they're running small accounts, they have their personal account and like, you know what? Nobody cares. Cause you have 300 followers. You're not reaching the amount of people that a Joe Rogan, a Cameron Haynes are. So those account, and honestly, like those guys are even more safe. These women hunters that post, they get completely annihilated, which is totally sexist by these an animal rights activist groups. Like if you want to troll, troll everybody equally. <laughs> yeah. But, but they don't, they hit these women, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Katie Vance like, is that her name? Um, yeah. I don't know her first. She gets murdered on these, these, uh, maybe that's the wrong word for talking about killing animals, but you know what I'm saying? Like she gets slaughtered uh, once again. Uh, she gets, <laughs> she, <laughs> she gets hammered on these, uh, these animal rights activists. They actually follow her so that they can report it because they figured out there's this automation process to where they can get the content censored and they take away your voice. So even at the level that, um, you know, maybe this content gets reviewed and it's found not to be sensitive. Um, they're still able to have an impact on her reach and her content. Now that's a personal level, but brands are dealing with the same thing, man. Like, um, you know, our, uh, a lot of clients that we've signed early, we do, we do have advertisers. I don't want to make it sound like we don't. Um, but they, they, a lot of them have come to us or a lot of the ones we're talking to are having a really hard time 
marketing products on the Facebook side, um, Facebook in particular, but it's gotten a lot worse with Instagram. You know, Ronella even had a post of a mountain lion killed the other day, get censored. And this was a nature photography shot. Uh, so this stuff is, it's, it's becoming more frequent. It's, it's there. It's interesting how they're handling it. They're, they're now censoring, um, gun companies. They're asking you if you're 21 and over, which that part, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that, honestly, like that's fine. Uh, but they are, they're definitely doubling down on this type of content. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to fear monger here. Like, honestly, at the end of the day, I hope eventually our platform gets so good that like in this space that this is really not even a conversation. Like I honestly have already gotten to the point where I'm like, yeah, like you can't post in the same on those other places, but really we're better. Like I want to be better no matter what. And, and that's what we strive for. I don't really like even having to say, but you're censored elsewhere because then that's like, it's like, yeah, but I'm not really like Katie Vance like is, but do I really care? No, you know, like I want to win for the better product. Um, I do think we are starting to get there. You know, people used to be able to say that we're Instagram for the outdoors because we had photo posting. It was, you know, a social media platform, even though we had trophies and recipes. It's like, yeah, at the, for the most part. But now it's like we got activity tracking. So now it's like, well, they're like Instagram, but they're kind of like Strava and Runkeeper. And, you know, you can do all these. It's got recipes like Pinterest. And, you know, it's like it's starting to become its own thing when it get, becomes hard to explain that'll either be really good or really bad. We've either overcomplicated it or we've carved out our own thing uh, <laughs> that, that is so cool that you like, it's like, no man, it's just go wild. Like that's what I want to be. I don't want to be this whole, like, you know, we, we fought censorship in one, you know, that's not really where I want to live, but I do think there's a lot of value there. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, you don't, and it's, and it's easy to tell now. And then the more that, you know, I'm open to, or not open, that's the wrong word to use, but the more that I've uh, used the app and, and talked to you and learned about it, you know, it's not just, you know, the, the Instagram or the hunting community or anything. And that's, I think that's super important in, in the way that your vision is and your team is, you know, working towards, you know, creating that, that ultimate outdoor experience, you know, through, through a, a version of social media. I think that's awesome. And, and, and again, one of the reasons why when you, you know, talk to me about this, when you introduce yourself and you and I kind of hit it off and, and I thought that, that this app is something that I think, you know, the people that are listening to this podcast and, and the people that I interact with could really, you know, benefit from it. Yeah. And, and I think people think like, oh, I'm going to take my Instagram post and post it on go wild. Like initially that's what you think it is. It's not that like I actually, I, I post on both. I have a, you know, I have, I actually just deleted my Facebook account, but I have a, um, a Instagram account. I have a LinkedIn account and I have, uh, I told you I love Twitter and, and my go wild account. And I, I actually like every now and then I will cross post pretty similarly, but I actually see them with very different purposes. Um, like if I like coming into archery season, I had all kinds of questions about shooting my bow, my audience on Instagram I've built up since 2012. There's, it's relatively useless to post about that on my Instagram account. And I don't have a big following. I have like 1,600 personal followers. It's not like it's a, it, I, I don't have enough reach to me, be meaningful. But guess what? That's still more than most people. So, like, if that's my experience with the platform, that's most people's experience. So, you know, you're not really going to get that much meaningful engagement. Um, I, people at, I have so many people tell me, like, you know what? Dude, you get campaigns on your platform. That's going to be the way you all succeed. I'm like, actually, dude, it's not because campaigns is going to open up our platform and be like, well, screw this. I didn't get 200 comments on my post. This place sucks, you know? Yeah. Like, but the, the average dude, the blue collar guy who, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using dudes here. Sorry. Late. There are ladies on our platform. Uh, Jen, Jen, my, my chief marketing officer, Jen is cringing right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's working hard to, to, to work with a lot of, she's done a great job of, uh, put in a woman's perspective in this, but I'm going to use, let's just, since 90% of hunters are dudes, I'm going to use this, uh, average, average person of, uh, a blue collar dude works hard, gets the, the guy earlier that we said gets to spend a lot of time outdoors. They post on their Instagram and you know what? It goes unseen. They get four or five likes. They don't get 300 likes and 20 comments. That's not the world that most people live in. Our platform gives them a chance to have a voice and to tell their story and have people actually see it and engage with it and get feedback like you talked about. And it's just not happening elsewhere. It's not happening for that regular person. Like I actually, um, pardon my language, don't give a shit about the influencers. Like I didn't build this platform for the influencers. I built this because I was having a hard time getting information. I was having a hard time 
personally uh, learning how to whitetail hunt better. And, I, you know, I did not build this to be another vanity check mark on um, some influencer who has 100,000 followers to come in and say that they're on this platform too. Like, that's just, we're never going to be that. Um, and, and brands that want to tap into our network for that, I just, I like honestly just shut it off. It's like, look, this is probably not the right fit for us. So, um, you know, if, if you're into it for learning and you want to share your story with like-minded people, you know, I think you should check it out. It's, it's, it's actually quite a bit different than what your experience is going to be on other platforms. Awesome. Well, Brad, thanks for, you know, going into everything with go wild and, and talking about that. Is there anything else that you want to add from that side of it? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, I've, I've kind of nerded out on the tech side. I've, I've, uh, talked about what we can do for other people, but one thing I want to point out about this platform and our company overall is we are small. We don't have a big budget, but one thing that's been very important to us from the beginning is giving back into conservation and, when you use a platform like a Facebook or an Instagram that is fighting hunting, you, you don't need to pay them uh, your money. Your eyeballs earn them money. And I, I just told you I use them too. I use Instagram too. Um, a lot of that is so that I can tell my go wild story though and, and try to spread the word about what we're doing. But every time you see an ad, you just made them an impression. And those impressions – they, they charge money for those. So per thousand impressions, they get somewhere between, you know, a couple bucks to seven dollars, depending on what you're converting on it. I mean, it's like it, it's crazy how much money can be made through these dig, the digital advertising. You're supporting these platforms that don't support what you do. I, I want people to know that, you know, we I'm not asking you to quit those platforms, but I am asking people to think about the value of their time and the value of um, them as a person. And, and we're supporting groups like Raising My Doors, which is um, starting camps all across the country to teach kids to hunt and fish. You know, we've been their lead advertiser for two years. I'm now on the board um, very passionately. Like that's a total distraction for us, to be honest, like to, to and Aaron would know that. Like I, I in, in some ways, some some of our advisors might say, hey, you know, you really shouldn't do that. You could you could make more money if you didn't spend so much time working with that little nonprofit. And I, I and my response to that is like, yeah, but I might help. I might be able to help one kid uh, this year get outside that wasn't going to be able to do so this year without the resources that we put into that. Um, like for the money we put in, we could get a lot of users into our platform. But like we really take pride in getting kids outside and, and putting our money where our mouth is. We just partnered with the National Wild Turkey uh, Federation uh, and they saw value in our, our platform for mentorship. Um, you know, I am very passionate about R3. I mean, we, you and I didn't even talk about it today. R3 is the recruitment, retainment, and re-engagement of hunters. Um, I can do this same length show talking about everything that we're trying to do, all the effed up problems in this industry and how people are looking at this. And um, there are a ton of things that got to be figured out and they got to be figured out fast, like talking next nine years because the baby boomers, when they peace out, we just lost a third of our hunters. That's a third of our voting power. And we're already getting pretty low. Um, I, I think there's some huge shifts that have to happen in our, our conversation of how we're talking about hunting. And a big part of that is like it's bringing up that next generation of uh, that's adult hunters. That's people my age that are trying to figure this out for the first time. But it's also kids. And that's something that we're really passionate about. So, you know, being in our platform, supporting what we're doing it, it, in a lot of ways, it is uh, someone saying, you know what, I do want to I do care about the next generation. I do uh, want to help. And, and we're going to put not only are you helping us have more reach, um, which is essentially what I'm saying when you you know, eyeballs equal advertising dollars to the platform you're using. But you're also, we're going to point out ways that you can help. I can't tell you the number of people that we've actually inspired through our, um, our, our giveaways. We're, we're giving away two turkey hunts right now. I don't know when the show's airing, but, uh, I think one of them ends in two days. So that one's probably not going to be open, but we another one. We have a parent child turkey hunt sweepstakes that the, the parent can write an essay in on how, uh, why they want their kid to be a lifelong hunter. And we're going to pay for somebody to bring their kid to hunt in Virginia with Aaron from Raising My Doors. And, and that's with our partner, Outdoor Access. Uh, they're like the Airbnb of hunting. It's a pretty cool concept. But, you know, we're working, even with our advertisers, we're looking for ways to get more people into hunting. So I just hope people realize, like, yeah, I'm a tech guy. I kind of just sit here and talk about how cool our technology is. But at the core of what we do every single day, I come in here and I, I try to figure out 
how to use this platform to get more people outside to grow hunting. Like even that echo chamber we talked about, uh, one of the criticisms on my message of trying to get more people into hunting with a closed network, people say, well, how are you going to do that? And I say, well, I can't tell you the number of people I've seen come into our platform for fishing and they end up trying hunting for the first time. I mean, the best people we're going to win are those fringe people. So um, just know, I just want people to know that like this isn't all about the tech for me. Um, this is a passion. I started this thing because I had a problem I wanted to solve for myself. I was trying to be a better whitetail hunter and I thought all the options out there sucked. So, um, I thought we could do better and I think we have, I think if you try it, you'll, you'll find that out. Uh, you can go to, um, download gowild.com and, and give it a shake. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a really good way to kind of, to bring it all together. And, and so the, the R3 efforts that you're talking about, I had, um, I had a couple guests on the podcast from Kansas State University a while back, last August, I think it was. Um, so uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers had a collegiate program there, and one of their big focuses w- was um, within the R3 efforts. And Dr. Um, Allers that I had interviewed on there, Adam Allers, as well as uh, the club president, Ian Burrow, went through uh, all, all of that. And it's a really inter interesting concept and and that's awesome to be, hear that go wild is very passionate about it and you know at the core of it yeah i mean it, it it's uh, it's become a hot topic within the industry i think a lot of the ways the industry is approaching it is misguided i think there's a lot of great efforts too uh Nas- national wild turkey federation is one of the best organizations and how they're approaching it but it's going to take a it's going to take more than one it's going to take more than my group it's going to take more than just nwtf but um yeah, if people, if people really care about hunting and fishing, again, I, I, that stat I said, I did not make that up. Uh, there are projections that Wisconsin, uh, at the rate things are declining, they may not have hunting in 2050. People like to think that this is some right that you have. You don't. That you, you buy that hunting license for a reason. It's permission. And um, our government regulates what we do. And if we ever lose the voting power or, or really like it's not even like you have to have a majority voting power. Right now, most people don't care. If we ever lose that and people start to care that we hunt in a, in a negative way, it's gone, man. We got to build up our base. We got to help people understand why we do this. This goes back to the core of what I was saying earlier. Tell your story. You, you, everything you do, you should look at it as an advertising campaign for hunting. And guess what? Advertising works. There's a reason companies pay the money they do for it. It's because that repetition of a message works. It converts. Um, so, so when you talk about hunting, think about what you're saying, you know, think about that picture you're putting up. Is that really the best representation of hunting? If it is cool, if not, man, maybe you should save it. Don't post it. Awesome. Brad, thank you for, you know, going through this, all this information here with the go wild platform for, you know, creating it and being able to reach people and create that engagement. Like I said, that really it's it's really true engagement and the people on there one i like you said about when when you have issues with the bugs and they're really friendly my my again just small uh time frame of using the app everyone has been extremely friendly and and nice and and really goes into a lot of detail when explaining things so i think the listeners could get a lot of value in checking out the go wild app so Brad, again, thank you for coming on and thank you for having me on your podcast, you know, recently, which I'm, I'm going to release that as a bonus episode here on, on here. So your podcast, which you hadn't, you mentioned a little bit, but Restless Native, and it's a, a very good podcast that goes into anything, you know, from hunting to business and, and fishing and everything in between, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. I get into a little bit of everything and, uh, some pretty heavy topics and uh sometimes it's some pretty ridiculous topics and my my dog farts in the middle of the show and we have fun with it so uh <laughs> it's like you know it's, it gets a little bit of everywhere like we'll, we'll talk about depression one day and the next day i'm talking about having a fun having fun on a uh, uh hunting trip so uh I'm, I'm gonna uh send you the file we'll get the bonus show up man i, I appreciate you letting me come on and, and talk about what we do I, one fun way uh let's do this um you and i are both on go wild Go Wild has the functionality to log those episodes. People should try that out. This is one of my favorite things about the platform um, is, is the podcast logging. I love getting the feedback from my show, but I also have found a lot of times like people I'm interested in will be on other shows or I'll find new shows. And if you go in and post, push that plus sign and there's a little clock, you know, scroll down a little bit, you see a clock, tap the clock, tap outdoor podcast. You can search for both show and it, you'll find uh, 
my name on there. So tap the show and then tag both of us to tell us what you liked or didn't like about the show. You know, tell us what you agreed with. Tell us that you thought that Brad got talked too much, uh, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love sharing this stuff. And, and a lot of times you'll incite other people that said, Hey man, I listened to that too. And I thought the same thing or, you know, Hey, well, I don't think that's what Brad meant by saying this. It, I really thought he was saying more of this, or you should listen to this show. He talked about that a little more. You'd be surprised at the conversations that can come out of that. And I think it's cool because a lot of these hosts of the shows people listen to are on our platform. You know, Cable Smith, the Lone Star Outdoor show is on there. Cody Rich from the Rich Outdoors, uh, Dan with the Nine Finger Chronicles. Like there, there's podcasters on there watching. So uh, tag them, you know, log, log time for it. But I'd love to, if you tag us for both show here, it's a great way to promote Bo. First of all, uh, you know, promote the show that you're supporting here, uh, free advertising for Bo. Hey, uh, and then, you know, <laughs> let us, let us know what you thought. Yeah. It, that it, I've gotten a lot of good, um, information from seeing what people write about my shows on there and everything else. And, and it's just interesting to hear perspectives. You know, I always ask for feedback, whether that's positive or negative. So, Again, Brad, thank you so much for coming on the podcast here. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you again soon, man. Yeah, man. We'll, we'll come back and do a whole show on R3. Well, how about first you get your wife the pizza that you thought you were calling about and and you yeah, take care, make sure she's happy. Well, it, uh, obviously, and you know this, I'm, I don't I don't think you don't, but I'll, I'll say that obviously that was a joke, but now she's literally hit me up. I have to hit, I, I'm being instructed to pick up chicken sausage on the way home so <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't too far off no i wasn't too far off uh, it's kind of funny man if i'm cooking i'll cook venison or whatever's laying around the freezer and uh she she I, she's slowly getting into that but tonight it looks like we're eating uh grocery store chicken sausage so all right man i appreciate it it's funny you, you know two shows in a row we've ended uh at around the same time both hungry um and talking about food so i guess it is time to wrap it in that case then yeah <laughs> <laughs> awesome brad well you have a good right, rest dude. of your night we'll talk soon buddy yeah appreciate you thanks so much for listening to this episode of east meets west hunt with your host bo martonic for more great content and to stay up to date visit east meets west hunt.com facebook at east meets west outdoors and instagram at east meets west hunt if you enjoyed today's episode please review and subscribe and we'll catch you next time